for our next presenter. Um, he states that Zabbix has the perfect out-of-the-box toolset for IoT monitoring. And actually, he is going to prove it to you with his next presentation. So let's welcome the pre-sales director from Imaginet, Colombia, Luis De La Torre. Hello, and welcome to the Zabbix Summit 2020. Over this 20 minute uh, session, we're going to discuss the role of Zabbix as an IoT telemetry data processing powerhouse. My name is Luis de la Torre, and the pre sales director of Imagonet, a certified partner of Zabbix from Colombia that also supports and helps customers in other countries in the VF region, including Ecuador and Peru. Hopefully, after this pandemic, you will be able to visit us and know the beautiful locations and get to know the people that uh, call these countries home. Uh, Imagonet has many, many verticals from logistics to manufacturing to telecom. And in all these verticals, we do integrate Savix as the event engine for all the uh, telemetry data processing that we collect, either from custom uh, sensors and gateways that feed data to um, uh, proprietary applications via webhooks or web services directly supported on, on some really complex sensors to open IoT gateways that support NQTT, SNMP as protocols to propagate data. Uh, no matter the architecture, Savix is at the core and we're, gonna discuss, we're going to discuss five features that really uh, make Savix stand out for us. We've been using some of these for three years for, in up to four years. And the reality is that they had made a remarkable impact on the success that we have in this, in this space, in this region. Some of the features are going to be related to pre-processing. Some of the features are going to be related to the capability to create calculated items. Some are embedded into the concept and the, the segregated architecture that Habits has. Uh, and, and some of these are really behind the integration philosophy that, that Savix has been followed for the last years. Um, we're going to start by throttling. And, and throttling for us was one of the few features that really make a remarkable impact on how efficient and, and really cost effective we are. Uh, there, you're going to find in the field sensors that have this uh, unchanged behavior over time. In this example, we have open, close uh, door sensors that basically change status one per minute or one per hour or, or even a couple of times per day. And you get all these redundant data that gets stored in the database. By implementing a, a simple discard and change with Harvey uh, preprocessing step, what you actually do is that without losing consistency on time series data, and that is remarkable because you want to get cons con concise and, and consistent uh, time intervals to present the data into the visualization layers, but you also want to save all those and remove all those re redundant records. Uh, I have two examples here with uh, an identical sensor, but with two different heartbeat configurations. On the first one, we do a 30 second heartbeat and we get up to a 83% uh, data record reduction on the database. When you get that uh, uh, heartbeat up to one hour, if the sensor allows it and your application can deal with those, uh, with those uh, let's say time periods, you will get up to 96% data reduction in, in in records. This is a massive and major game changer if you are managing thousands of sensors with these characteristics. So for us, it was one of the first things that we automatically embedded and, and included into our, our, our custom deployment, let's call it like that, because it makes a, ma a major difference in terms of cost savings for data set record storage. The second one is also pretty common you're going to find in the field sensors that are really, really precise and accurate. And these sensors usually use what is called analog output, basically by mapping the actual variable that they mentioned to a voltage or a current, you are able to get really, really 0.01% accuracy sensors 
for specific applications. It's really common on geological, on pressure, highly sensitive temperature measurements. And what you basically do is that you, via formula, you get that mapping into the actual variable that you are measuring. Um, I will say the majority, if not all the applications on the IoT space do this uh, mapping on a post-processing stage. So they basically store the voltage and then they run these formulas and these calculations to get the actual value of the variable that they are measuring. We in Savix do it a little bit different and it makes a major uh, difference in, 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 in terms of usability of the data. By using pre-processing, in this example, we're using JavaScript to create these formulas, we can calculate the actual variable before ingesting it into the database and get that actual uh, physical variable map into a record into the database without doing any post-processing. And with our storage garbage data at the end, that is the voltage of the current reference that you're using. In this example, we use it a lot with geological sensors, inclinometers, speedometers, all these sensors that determine really accurate uh, the condition of the soil where a road is being built or a oil drilling is being performed. And we can get this 0.01% accuracy sensors with the actual variable stored directly in the database. So if you're working with geological, we really, precise sensors in temperature or in medical applications, you're gonna see that this is a major differentiator because most of the applications will have to do this in post-processing and you may not get that uh, compute power to do it at that point. Or you simply store a lot of data that you, that you will never use again. So that's in terms of pre-processing and pre-processing. Uh, one of the key difference and challenges that you will face also in the field if you enter into the IoT domain is that you're going to have all these sensors, identical sensors, with pre-configured threshold for alerts. And usually you, you put those thresholds into the design, design and implementation phase of a project. And this sensor may run one, two, three, four years, even 10 years in some of these cases. Uh, without much change. But the conditions in which the sensor operates do change over time. It's what we call consistent behavior change. And by introducing calculated items that allow us to change the upper and lower threshold levels based on historical data uh, being uh, compiled, either by average or moving average or weighted average or whatever method you choose to to do those uh, historical calculations, you may create adaptive thresholds that over time reflect the consistent behavior change of the sensor and the variable that it's measuring. So in this example, we have a temperature uh, sensor that has consistent uh, uh, changes in its behavior, but it's not necessarily a, as anomaly. It's a, con it's a change in the environmental condition that it's measuring. So what we're doing is, Instead of having continuous revisions and, 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 and configuration changes of the threshold values, either because the customer chooses to create a really, really loose threshold or really strict thresholds, uh, what you're going to see is that if you do that manually, when you're talking about thousands of sensors, what you will face is an operational nightmare. Basically, so we want to automate this process. We also want to make sure that the alert that the customer is receiving is relevant because if you get overflow by alerts, most of the time at some point you start looking at the notification channel. And if you don't get any alert, but you know that something is going on in the customer premises, then your sensor is mostly irrelevant. So you want to have some level of automation and we find out that these calculated it items uh, procedure to adjust the threshold is ideal. Multiply this by thousands and tens of thousands of sensors, and we basically have a, an automated procedure to adapt to the customer environment with consistent changes in behavior. In that war is critical, consistency. We're looking for changes that over time are recurrent, and we know that it's not that it's not an anomaly. You may need tuning, you may need to understand what the actual uh, formulas and calculation are relevant for your 
particular case, but you have that power embedded into, into Savix. So up to this point, we only discussed capabilities, feature and functionalities that we have in Savix, but even the architecture that has been put in place by the Savix team really fits well into the IoT domain because you have this disaggregated agent proxy server architecture that enables you to put the compute power and the pre-processing power where you really need it. So even before FIDA 2, you may have a, a powerful enough gateway, IoT gateway, to run a Savix proxy. Basically because you have so many measuring points in that customer premises that you can use uh, the pre-processing power of a proxy and run all these calculations directly on the customer premises. You may have really lightweight sensors or gateways that may not be able to run a Savix proxy, but may use a Savix agent with a customized collection data scripts. And you can get that data directly into, into the server. So whatever combination you are using, even embedding it into IoT core application for the major uh, uh, cloud providers like AWS, Microsoft, and Google, you can feed that data directly into the Savix server without losing the disaggregated capabilities of the proxy and the agent. So you can get all these different configurations that basically adapt to what the customer is doing. And now with Savix uh, FIDA 2, you get NQTT and module support natively. So you don't have to create these customized adapters or ingestion scripts. You can get that data directly into, into service natively. So with all these combinations, it's really difficult to find a sensor gateway application architecture that you cannot fit accordingly into the Savix platform architecture. And that's a major difference because you are going to change your configuration many, many times because in IoT, there is no cookie cutter uh, uh, solution. So you will have to adapt to different customers. So if you are doing smart cities or you're doing transportation or you're doing food processing uh, and manufacturing and logistics, you may have to, to take different architecture approaches to this. And once again, this architecture is ideally designed for that. And finally, one of the, I will say, mantras of the Savix team in terms of integration, the openness and the agility to bring more and more applications for visualization and notifications into the Savix ecosystem is critical for us. Because you have to remember that many of these customers are industries that not necessarily had a strong IT background or even do not have a strong IT team. But you have to put in their hands the best visualization and notification schema possible because you want this organization to take and, and, and really integrate these capabilities and these dashboards into their operation. So by bringing tools like Grafana, by having native support of Telegram as a, as a notification channel, you can bring all these helpful tools to a non-IT background operations team in manufacturing, in logistics, and food processing in retail, you choose the, the, the vertical in industry and you most likely will see that challenge, but you can make it really accessible. At this point, we have customers from distribution center uh, managers to logistics supervisor, to plant manufacturing uh, leaders that use on a day-to-day -day basis these dashboards and the notification channels as the way to understand how the business is performing. And you're doing this by putting a tool that is intuitive, that is fresh, that is simple, is attractive to them. And the way that Savix and Grafana, Savix and Telegram work with and interconnect uh, is really a, a major differentiator from, from a product portfolio. That is really a strong point. And if we get more into details into Grafana and, and all the and all the other layers that we have here, there are more and more uh, strong points that can, can do that synergy between Gafana and Savix idea. So basically we cover five different capabilities and, 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 and let's say functionalities that make Savix a really standout player in this space. We've been talking about pre-processing and how, and how it helps to reduce the amount of records that you have. Uh, the pre-processing stuff for analog uh, sensor measurement and data storage, the 
capability to create adaptive threshold based on calculated items. We talk about how the distributed architecture of Savix really fits well into the IoT challenges that you will face. And finally, the, the agile and open integration that Savix had, that is an ideal recipe to solve problems in real customers with an unprecedented uh, uh, agility. So now you add the 5.2 uh, uh, features, especially the native NQTT and module support, and you will have the most comprehensive tool to get data and present that data into customers uh, on a massive, massive scale with an open source, uh, uh, let's say, predefined topology put in place. So we really believe that Savvy is just keep getting better, especially for IoT. It's just becoming one of the strong players in this space. And we invite you to use all these tools and start building uh, solutions for your business, for your customers. And we are happy to, to address any questions and, and help you to figure out how to get there. We really appreciate that you took these minutes to talk with us. And we really hope that you enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for the elaborate explanation about how we can monitor IoT devices. Really useful, especially with 5.2. So we have a couple of questions. Um, what, in your experience, are the most common issues when working with and setting up IoT monitoring? Uh, well, a really good question. Uh, there are many, many layers on this on this type of solution. Maybe getting the right sensor and making sure that, that you have the adequate architecture to, to, to answer and address the questions of, uh, and, and, and challenges that the customer poses is one of them. Uh, getting that ecosystem built is critical. The second part is what you do with the data, and that's where service really stand out. I think that you get massive volumes of data into a, into a data lake, and eventually that data has to be used in some way by, by the customer. And those, if you solve those two problems, I will assure you that those are the major two challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my guess would be pretty much the same as you. Those are challenges that I've seen other people encounter that I myself have encountered that I can kind of relate. Um, one more question. So oftentimes our community members and potential clients and existing clients also, they want to not only monitor IoT devices, but also to control them from within Zabbix. Um, in your experience, is this possible? Have you done it? If not, how would you do it? Yes, indeed it is possible. I know that especially for non-IT companies, like most of the customers that we have in IoT, it's really tough to, to go into aut autopilot model. Uh, that's basically how we, we call it when, when, when we had triggers eventually getting to the actual infrastructure of the customer. We are seeing more and more automation on some uh, spaces, especially on, on food processing, that they are more happy to allow us to control that. NQTT supports those, those, those flows to send instructions and command dance to actuators in the field. But it's, it's, more, it's not more a technical limitation. It's more the operations and business part of the, of the industry trying to relinquish that control and give it to a, basically a machine that, that we control that remotely. And we will do that. We already have some, some use cases about that, and we can discuss this in, in our chat. But, but yeah, it's definitely technical possible. The challenge is on the business perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you a lot. So like you said, people can catch you Thank in the Q&A section in the chat, and then you can discuss this in more detail. Thank you. For sure.